Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Multi-Ministerial Task Force COVID-19 Press Conference. On our panel today, we have Minister for Health, Mr. Gan Kim Yong, Minister for National Development, Mr. Lawrence Wong, Director for Medical Services, Professor Kenneth Mark. May I invite Minister Gan to begin with a few words? Minister Gan, please. Uh, thank you. Once again, I thank you for, uh, for coming to this uh, press conference. Uh, as you know, it has been a week since uh, phase two, the start of phase two. While the number of cases in the community remain low, we have to stay vigilant because the challenge is not over yet. As more activities resume, in fact, and the frequency of uh, close contacts uh, will rise, we expect the number of cases to go up probably one or two weeks after the initial opening of uh, phase two. We must therefore get ready to quickly detect and isolate these cases to prevent large clusters from forming. To do so, we will strate strategically test more as we ramp up our testing capacity so that we can pick up cases faster. We have been testing more extensively among key population groups in the community. Let me just give you a few examples. We now test all close contacts of confirmed COVID-19 cases at the start at the end of their quarantine period, regardless whether they have symptoms or not. This is part of active case finding. It also means that we are able to detect cases even if they have no symptoms, even if they are asymptomatic. We also test for surveillance purposes, especially those who are vulnerable or have a higher risk of exposure to COVID-19. These include residents and staff of nursing homes, preschool staff, and those returning to work in some essential services sector. As we begin to reopen our borders, we will also be testing incoming travellers before the end of their stay-home notice period. In order for us to pick up COVID-19 cases among those with acute respiratory infections early, we have started to test those aged 45 years and above with ARI upon their first presentation to doctors. Rather than to wait for a period of time uh, you know, when they have a prolonged ARI. So, we are going to test them on the first day when they see the doctor with ARI symptoms. We will be extending our age criteria, not just 45 and above, but we will extend our age criteria to all individuals age 13 and above, starting from 1st July 2020. I want to take this opportunity to thank all our healthcare partners from both the public and private sectors who have stepped forward to fight this war with us. These include more than 900 public health preparedness clinics or PHPCs. The last four months, more than 450,000 patients have benefited from subsidies for treatment of respiratory infections at the PHPCs and polyclinics with around $31 million in subsidies disbursed to date. In recognition of the role that PHPCs play in supporting the nation's effort in com combating this COVID-19, despite the challenging circumstances, MOH will provide a one-off COVID-19 grant, as announced by DPM Hank earlier, totaling $10,000 to each PHPC. The grant will support PHPCs in caring for patients with respiratory symptoms and defray additional costs incurred while doing so. MOH will also provide a one-time swap and send home startup grant of $1,200 to PHPCs in the SESH program, swap and send home program, to help clinics defray their additional startup cost. MOH is committed to take good care of our healthcare professionals who are on the front line of our COVID-19 fight. We will ensure that all of them are adequately protected with personal protective equipment or PPEs. While the risks of infection are low with proper PPE, we recognize that should the doctors get infected, or doctors of the PHPCs get infected or are quarantined, the whole clinic may be impacted as many of these clinics are run on a solo GP basis. MOH will therefore provide an assurance grant to support PHPCs whose regular practicing GPs contract COVID-19 or are placed on quarantine order during the course of their work. 
Eligible PHPCs will receive $500 per day for the duration of the doctor's recovery or quarantine period. This will allow them to employ a locum or to cover the cost and the loss of revenue of the uh, clinic while they are under quarantine or while they are ill and recovering in the hospital. We hope that these initiatives will help, our re will help us reassure our GPs as they continue to take care of our COVID-19 patients. At the individual level, we can each play our part to prevent ourselves from getting infected and to keep one another safe. Let us all continue to be socially responsible, stay vigilant, and not let our guards down. Now let me say a few words in Mandarin. Dear 因此我们会策略性的进行更多的检测这些我们都需要进行检测的病情维持了几天没有好转之后才来检测采取防范的措施，保护自己，保护家人，这样我们才能够安全的继续开放，让我们的整个国家、整个社区都能够得到平安。Now let me invite uh, Director of Medical Services, Professor Kenneth Mark, to share the update on today's uh, medical situation. Kenneth, thank you very much, Minister. As of the 25th of June, uh, 1,200 hours. The Ministry of Health has uh, preliminarily confirmed an additional 113 cases of COVID-19 infection in Singapore. Uh, the vast majority continue to be work permit holders residing in the uh, foreign worker dormitories. Uh, based on our investigation so far, uh, there are five cases in the community, of whom one is a Singaporean and four are work pass holders. Uh, we're still working through the rest of the numbers and uh, details. Uh, these uh, information will be uh, provided in the press release that comes out later tonight. Thank you. Uh, good evening. We are continuing with our strategy of undertaking aggressive testing and uh, tracing to control the spread of the infection. And so far, uh, we have been able to do so through phase one. And now in the first week of phase two, the situation remains stable, but we are monitoring it very carefully and remaining very vigilant. Uh, where the migrant worker dormitories are concerned, up to now, we have about 120,000 workers who have either recovered or have been tested uh, to be free from the virus. By the end of next month, we expect about 70 to 80 percent of the workers staying in the dormitories to be cleared, meaning they will have either recovered or tested to be free from the virus. So, by the end of next month, we would have covered quite a large proportion of the workers in the dormitories. And shortly after that, beyond that, we would be able to completely clear all the workers 
and clear the dormitories and they would be able, all the workers we expect would be able to resume work thereafter. So we are controlling the infection in the community and we are continuing to make progress to clear the migrant worker clusters and the dormitories and allow the workers to resume work safely. Uh, we are now one week past uh, phase two reopening. I think the majority of Singaporeans and residents in Singapore have cooperated with the measures. They have acted responsibly and taken all the necessary precautions even while they go about resuming their activities. Unfortunately, uh, there are still individuals, business owners, operators, as well as individuals who have, who are, who have acted irresponsibly. Some are still doing so. Uh, our safe distancing ambassadors, our enforcement officials are on the ground, deployed, checking um, regularly all the different places. And they will not hesitate to take uh, anyone who breaches the rules to task. And if there are egregious cases, uh, these will be prosecuted and charged in court. And we have made it very clear, anyone that's a first offender, there will be a fine. Beyond that, if we see any egregious cases, we will prosecute and charge them in court. And if they happen to be individuals on work passes, their work passes may be revoked. If these are businesses or offices that breach the rules, and if these are again egregious breaches, we will go in and we will shut down the operation immediately. It's a business or office, they will have to close right away. And this will impact the business, it will impact the office, and that's why it is so important for all businesses to understand that they have to take the measures seriously. This is not something that you try to minimize effort and then wait and hope that the authorities do not come and check on you. Because if you take that sort of attitude, you can be sure that at some point in time, someone will report the lapses that they see in your business premises and we will come down and we will ask you to close. And the consequences of that closure will be much worse for any business. So it's far better for all businesses to take the measures seriously and do their utmost now to comply to the, with the full extent of the requirements. Uh, so we seek everyone's cooperation to do this, both in businesses and individuals. Take all of the measures seriously. It requires discipline. It requires some sacrifice on the part of all of us. But collectively, if we do this, we will stand a better chance of a safe and sustainable reopening in phase two. Thank you. Uh, questions from the floor? Thank you, panelists. We'll now begin with the Q&A session. Members of the media, please remember to use the raise hand function if you would like to ask a question. Please only ask one question to allow more to participate in the Q&A. May we have the first question from Ke Yang of Zhao Bao, please. Hi, good afternoon, ministers and uh, Dr. Mark. Uh, the first question that I have is uh, regarding the testing capacity. How, how is the cap testing capacity that we have now per day? So how many people we can test? And in, in, the, in that view, uh, will it, because there's a lot of uh, interpersonal contact that may happen during the campaigning period of the upcoming general election, uh, will the Ministry of Health be considering or making mandatory for uh, the campaigning teams to actually be tested before the actual campaign activities happen? Thank you. Uh, I'll ask um, DMS to talk about the testing uh, 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 criteria uh, again. Uh, let me just say that uh, currently we are testing about uh, 11,000 in uh, total per day. Uh, this includes uh, all the tests uh, and different uh, uh, the test regime that I mentioned earlier as well. So we do about 11, 12,000 per day. Sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. Our capacity is a bit higher than that. 
so we have some uh, uh, margin and some uh, buffer that will allow us to now move on to uh, the uh, ARI uh, uh, test, which I mentioned earlier. We are going to move from those of 45 and above to include those who are 12 years and above. And uh, this will include the first day uh, uh, that you pre present yourself to the doctors, we will swab you and test you. So this will uh, be a significant increase in our testing uh, regime in the, uh, detecting uh, COVID-19. Uh, I'll ask uh, uh, Kenneth to add on, if any on, as well as uh, uh, whether we will test uh, candidates. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll start off first by talking about our testing uh, capabilities. Uh, Minister is correct. We've been steadily expanding the capabilities that we have. Uh, and uh, currently, we uh, hover some, uh, somewhere between 11, 12,000 on a daily basis uh, 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 consistently. But on certain days, that number, in fact, uh, increases. It's gone up uh, even up to 14,000 in a day. Uh, and this is dependent on the testing strategy uh, imposed for the day. Uh, they are... Uh, tests that are performed, as you know, as part of the uh, medical support for the dormitories, for the migrant workers living in the dormitories, as part of the uh, dorm clearing strategy. And depending on the block, depending on the dorm that uh, is uh, selected for the day, uh, the testing numbers may uh, change. And this also partly accounts for why the case count sometimes varies on a day-to-day -day basis. In addition to that, we have the uh, regional centres that are carrying out uh, testing in the community, and we've uh, previously been uh, testing for those that uh, we deem to have a higher risk of exposure to COVID uh, cases, as well as those who are in contact uh, on a regular basis as part of their work uh, uh, with vulnerable uh, groups of people. And we require them to be tested. Some continue to be tested on a routine basis. More recently, over the last uh, few weeks, we've been expanding the uh, uh, community-based testing uh, regime to include uh, seniors, uh, students uh, and uh, staff who work in the schools, uh, students above the age of 12 years old, uh, with respiratory symptoms presenting to our clinics, uh, they would also be tested. And come July, uh, we will continue to be expanding this. Uh, um, uh, we are including, for a start, uh, all uh, people who present with respiratory, acute respiratory symptoms above the age of 45. But by July, we are hoping then to extend that to uh, the rest of the adult population as well. And steadily, we continue to expand uh, uh, the numbers of people that will be tested, both in the community as well as in the uh, dormitories. The test strategies uh, vary depending on the context. In the community setting, uh, many of these tests are in fact done via pool testing strategies in order to uh, uh, reap uh, as much efficiency in our testing uh, strategy. We could test them individually, but it makes more sense for us to be efficient in the process and we test them using pooled strategies. Uh, there's serology testing that's also being done uh, as part of epidemiological tracing, but also in the dormitories as part of the clearing strategies. We also uh, are exploring uh, different, more innovative ways of collecting uh, samples for testing, but uh, some of the uh, test strategies or collection strategies we're exploring have not reached uh, sufficient evidence to uh, or, or sufficiently good results uh, to satisfy us that they are ready for, uh, for regular use in the community. So we are continuing to explore and look at uh, these new uh, techniques for doing uh, testing. But with regard to the second question you've asked, uh, at this point in time, we do not require uh, testing to be done for those who are stepping forward uh, to campaign for elections uh, or to stand forward as uh, candidates. Uh, however, uh, the... Uh, candidates uh, or those who are in fact uh, uh, coming forward for the elections as well as their uh, supporters uh, must obey safe distancing uh, measures. Uh, these have been put forward already uh, by the elections department and uh, they are designed to protect the health and safety of all uh, members of the public as well as uh, those who are campaigning themselves. And we urge all uh, who are involved in the elections uh, to obey these uh, rules and regulations which are designed to protect them their supporters, as well as the public. Thank you. Thank you, panellists. Can we have the next question from Salma from Straits Times, please? Hello. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Gang mentioned earlier that the effect of uh, phase two will probably be seen in about two weeks' time. The question is, uh, well, I hope the cases in the community will not go up, but should it go up, it's just one week before general elections. And if the number in the community continues going up, is that going to impact on GE, 
And is there any infection number that will trigger uh, reintroduction of uh, circuit breaker measures? Uh, thank you. Uh, I mentioned, I explained this a few uh, conf uh, press conferences before. Uh, I'll repeat that again. Uh, first, uh, I think uh, the numbers may go up because of higher interaction and higher people-to-people uh, -people contact, so there's a higher chance of transmission. We, we know that currently there are underlying uh, cases, undetected cases, what we call cryptic cases, and that's why from time to time you have uh, unlinked cases being detected. So these are underlying cases, and with uh, more uh, interaction uh, after the opening, uh, the risk is that the number of cases will go up, and given the incubation period of between one to two weeks, uh, therefore you are likely to see cases coming up uh, after one or two weeks after the opening, uh, which means uh, next week or the week after. So there are uh, possibility that uh, the number of cases may start to grow. And I explained earlier that uh, it is important for us to look at uh, the nature of these cases. Uh, we expect that the number will go up, but we are more concerned about uh, cases where they form a large cluster. Like what we saw in the Safra and uh, the, the church cluster, and uh, uh, as well as the, uh, um, uh, the office clusters. And these clusters are a concern because uh, they are a multiple number of people uh, who are involved, who are infected, and we are also concerned about super spreading events that could uh, have a multiplying effect. So these are the trends that we are monitoring, and we are also worried about a sudden spike of a, a large number of cases, even though they are not uh, related to a cluster. So they are, uh, the nature of the cases is important, as, as important or if not more important than absolute number of cases. So we are monitoring and watching, and the response to this uh, number of cases will also depend on the nature of the cases. And uh, for example, if it's a cluster it's very in, in a very specific uh, setting, we may introduce uh, tighter measures in these settings after investigation and understanding the nature of the transmission. So we may not uh, go back to the circuit breaker where we have a nationwide uh, a circuit breaker where all activities stop except uh, essential activities. Uh, uh, unlikely to return to that scenario. What is more likely is to have a very targeted intervention depending on the nature of the outbreak and the nature of the infection and whether we are able to contain it within specific setting or specific groups of uh, uh, people or specific nature of uh, activities. And then we will have to depend on the actual cases when it happens. So the important thing is for us, uh, before these cases happen, we enhance our detection capability by expanding our ARI, doing more surveillance and watching uh, the trends more carefully. I think this will help inform us on the status of the infection in the community to allow us to react faster. Thank you, Minister Gan. Can we have the next question from John from Reuters? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, panellists. Um, two questions, if, if you'll allow me. Um, the first, uh, maybe for a DMS. Um, can you give us the official position on the use of dexamethasone in Singapore and stockpiling plans for remdesivir given reports it can cost up to $5,000 a dose? And second, sorry, for the minister... John, sorry, but we have to leave it there um, as we only allow for one question. Panelists, please. Uh, well, John, I'll, I will answer uh, your question. Uh, we have... Um, uh, looked with interest, uh, the data and the evidence that's coming out from the UK, uh, the evidence for dexamethasone uh, uh, ha having a positive impact on those who require oxygen support therapy and in the ICU uh, is very promising. Uh, but uh, beyond the news conference, we continue to wait for the, the formal publication of the data where more uh, of information uh, will come out. We have an expert work group that's in fact looking at uh, this right now, and, uh, and uh, they have... Uh, uh, published uh, interim uh, uh, guidance on on uh, on what to do in terms of looking after uh, patients with COVID. Uh, they are they are uh, planning to uh, put in an addendum into the uh, guidance document uh, with regard to dexamethasone to guide doctors in Singapore on how it is to be used. However, I will point out that uh, while uh, the news from the UK is encouraging, the evidence of benefit has been particularly in the group of. Uh, uh, patients who are more seriously ill, those who require oxygen therapy, and those who are in the ICU uh, in Singapore at this point in time. In fact, um, the majority of our patients have mild illness. We only have one patient uh, in the ICU for quite uh, uh, some time now. 
and therefore uh, how much benefit dexamethasone will have in Singapore for the patients that we have, uh, ultimately it may not be uh, that as big an impact as it is in the UK, uh, just simply because of the case mix and the severity of uh, infections that we're seeing in the UK as opposed to in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, that said, dexamethasone is a common medication in common use uh, in Singapore. We do have ample stock of the medication and we're not concerned at this stage of, uh, of uh, our supplies of uh, dexamethasone uh, running out. Uh, you've asked also about remdesivir. Uh, it is a uh, medication that uh, has been made available to some of our patients in uh, our hospitals uh, in the context of a trial uh, that, uh, uh, that's being done. In fact, the trial... Uh, 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 enabled uh, Gilead to, produce, uh, to uh, provide uh, these medications for some of these patients in the context of those studies. Uh, remdesivir has been recently approved by uh, our Health Sciences Authority uh, and therefore now there's an ability for the drug to also be brought into Singapore beyond the study context and we continue to work with the company uh, on how best um, uh, this medication should be used for our patients uh, and, uh, and uh, there are some discussions underway in terms of procurement as well. Um, as the discussions are still underway, I'm not in a position to be able to uh, provide further details at this stage. Thank you, panelists. Can we have the next question from Shara from CNA, please? Hi, um, good evening. So with the expansion of the criteria, um, the age criteria to 13, with uh, people with ARI, um, how about those who may not have these symptoms? Can they go in and can they possibly request to get tested even if they don't have any of these um, ARI symptoms? Uh, as, as I explained earlier, I think we, uh, uh, with the expansion of our capacity, we are able to do more testing, but even the, we are, as we are doing more testing, we do so in a very strategic way, in a very targeted way, because otherwise we'll just end up testing a lot of uh, people unnecessarily because they are not at risk, and the uh, 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 possibility of detecting a case will become very, very low. So it's not effective in uh, em employing our resources that way. So better for us to be quite focused, and these are people who have ARI already, the symptoms already, so it's very uh, much more likely to detect a case. Even then, the uh, possibility of uh, uh, cases being detected is already quite low because of the general low prevalence of uh, COVID-19 cases in the community. There are cases, but generally the prevalence is low, and therefore even testing ARIs, you may not be able to pick up significant uh, number of cases. Currently, we already have a surveillance, as I mentioned before, Based on uh, prolonged ARI symptoms, we do test uh, uh, every uh, now and then. And in fact, uh, we test about uh, 800 cases uh, 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 a day uh, over the last few days. And we have not detected any cases yet. It doesn't mean there are no cases because these are sampling. So therefore, you need to actually sample quite a lot of uh, samples before you are able to detect a case. And it's better for us to use our test capacity in a more targeted way so as to give us a better sense of whether there are underlying cases in the community. And for the cases that are asymptomatic, uh, they are likely to have uh, associated uh, symptomatic cases <clears throat> that we will be able to pick up uh, from our ARI testing anyway. <clears throat> so the ARI testing, other than uh, helping us to detect the cases early and faster, uh, it actually serves also as a surveillance to tell us that if there are X number of uh, ARI cases being detected, they are likely to have a similar number of cases of asymptomatic ca uh, cases that are not yet detected. So this gives us a sense of the overall landscape of the com uh, community infection uh, prevailing at that point in time. So I think by focusing on AI cases, it will already give us uh, sufficient uh, information. Over and above that, we are also, as I mentioned, doing uh, surveillance testing on asymptomatic uh, uh, people, uh, people with uh, no symptoms at all, and these are uh, uh, critical uh, workers, some of the essential workers. We mentioned that we are going to do a regular testing of some of them who are asymptomatic. This will also help to inform uh, 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 the, the MOH of the status of a community uh, transmission. So I think some of these uh, efforts are in place rather than to uh, uh, have a general uh, random uh, testing of uh, uh, people who walk in. I think it is uh, better for us to, have, to focus our uh, uh, targets of our capacity in testing. DMS, yes. 
Yeah, just to extend on uh, and uh, respond further to Cheryl, uh, while we are testing uh, in a much more extended way, symptomatic uh, uh, people coming forward with acute respiratory illness, I will point out that we are actually already testing quite extensively asymptomatic uh, people as well. Uh, we mentioned earlier about routine uh, regular testing of uh, frontline workers, those who are working in uh, essential services, those who are working uh, and in close contact with vulnerable uh, uh, groups of uh, people in the community. The vast majority of these uh, people uh, subject to testing are asymptomatic. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, it's not that we are not testing asymptomatic people. Uh, we are, and they do form a large proportion of those that are actually currently being tested. But this is a, a strategy of being more focused, such that we want to uh, make sure that the yield that we get from the testing uh, is, um, uh, is, is much higher than just uh, blindly testing uh, at a discretionary basis in, in the community uh, for asymptomatic uh, people. Uh, even in the uh, focused uh, group uh, testing, uh, we found, in fact, the, the percentage of uh, people com uh, coming down with COVID-19 detected uh, to be very low. So the yield, in fact, would be much lower uh, extending at this point in time uh, wide-based community discretionary testing of asymptomatic uh, populations. So we have not uh, made plans to move in that direction just yet. Thank you, panelists. Can we have the next question from Tessa from today? Uh, good evening, ministers and Dr. Mark. My question is on the travel bubble. So it's really been announced that the government is working with different countries to open travel bubbles or green lanes to kind of resume travel. So I just want to find out how would the news of the second wave of viruses that are breaking out in like South Korea, for example, in Beijing, will affect these discussions with various countries when it comes to establishing these travel lanes and travel bubbles. Thank you. Um. The, we continue to assess the situation in all the countries around us, and it's a dynamic situation. So we recognize that um, what happens today, the situation can change. So the position continues to evolve. But so long as the broad situation in that country is under control, uh, just because there is a flare-up of a few cases happening doesn't mean that immediately we put a stop to the travel green lane arrangements because remember the green the fast or green lane arrangements do come with their own safety protocols it's not about unrestrained travel right anyone who wants to come on that sort of arrangement uh, like the one we have with china now uh, first of all would require to be tested multiple times departure arrival uh, they will have a controlled itinerary and then when they go back they will serve a quarantine so there are quite a number of uh, safeguards in place for the travel. And so even if there are new cases emerging in some of these uh, places, so-called second wave, I think our broad assessment is if the situation um, in that country, if the infection situation in the country broadly remains under control um, and the flare-up of cases is not overwhelming their hospital systems, um, yes, there are new cases, but they are still able to do effective contact tracing to contain the cases and to prevent further spread. Then it's, it's not something that would stop us from um, continuing with the green or fast lane arrangements that we have worked out with these countries. Thank you, Minister Wong. Can we have the next question from Kai Yi from Channel 8? Hi, I would like to ask, uh, there have been some reports showing that for some patients after they discharge, they experience side effects such as lung blood clot or cerebral infarction. So do we see a lot of these cases which develop side effects after they discharge? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that question. Uh, this is a topic that we place close attention to. Uh, the evidence internationally considering the risks associated with uh, uh, COVID-19 infection, even after recovery, uh, is continuing to evolve and accumulate. Uh, I, I don't think uh, uh, many uh, uh, infectious disease experts, in fact, uh, at this time, uh, uh, would confidently say they, they have a complete understanding of uh, what the, the risks risk are or the consequences uh, that can uh, arise in COVID-19 patients. Uh, we have, uh, you may remember, uh, announced previously uh, the passing of one uh, 
uh, a migrant worker who in fact collapsed uh, after uh, uh, having fully recovered uh, from COVID-19 infection and subsequently passed away. Uh, and the cause of death was certified as a massive pulmonary thromboembolism. So we do have uh, a case where we um, uh, looked at it and we uh, recognized that this was a sequelae or complication that arose even after a recovery uh, from co an acute uh, COVID-19 infection. So it's not a, a risk that only occurs in the international setting. It also is a risk that we are paying close attention to in the Singapore setting. Uh, so we are, we are continuing to look at this, reviewing this, uh, and determining whether uh, we, it has, it, there's a possibility of identifying people who are at higher risk of getting complications, and if uh, we are able to identify them, whether or not we, we can do anything to lower that risk, to keep them under follow-up and uh, under monitoring. Uh, but at this stage, uh, the evidence for this is starting to emerge. We recognize uh, that there is a risk uh, of uh, such events occurring, uh, clotting disorders, uh, whether they occur in the lungs, in the heart, in the brain, causing strokes. Uh, but uh, at this stage, uh, there's insufficient information uh, to guide us in terms of whether every single worker, every single case that we encounter requires we are medications, or whether or not there's a possibility we could identify high-risk individuals for which uh, uh, some preventive or prophylactic treatment is possible to reduce that risk. Uh, so we are looking and reviewing the data and we are studying this very closely. Thank you, DMS. Can we have the next question from Philip from Bloomberg? Yeah, hi. Good to see you all. Uh, um, I'm, I almost feel badly asking about this, but uh, I wonder, if, given the situation, if you'll uh, maybe perhaps consider bringing down the DoorsCon level. Thanks. You should feel bad asking about this. <laughs> uh, we, uh, as you know, had progressively stepped up our DoorsCon uh, uh, levels until we reached DoorsCon Orange. And that was on the basis of a concern about community spread. We are uh, in a better situation now than when we first started uh, and when we raised the uh, DOSCON level to orange. Uh, but we would prefer to continue to watch the situation closely before we uh, want to bring the DOSCON level uh, any lower than what it is now. We've only just recently moved into phase two. We are continuing to watch very closely whether uh, as we resume many uh, of our services, whether in fact um, we would now see a resurgence of uh, community cases occurring or clusters. So we think it's premature to rush into making a decision about lowering our DOSCON level just now. Uh, we also want to make sure that uh, this doesn't cause a great sense of complacency among members of our public, uh, uh, which would then cause them to let, let down their guard, uh, relax on the discipline that they actually require with regard to hand hygiene, uh, infection control measures, wearing a mask, practicing safe distancing. Uh, De-escalating DOSCON is not the most important thing right now, but paying attention, maintaining that discipline is the most important thing that they have to do. And we will continue to watch this space, watch to see what the, the number of cases is like, and eventually uh, make a decision what to do with that DOSCON uh, level. It's, um, so so I, I, yeah. I, I just wanted to say that I wouldn't... Uh, uh, fault uh, Philip for asking that question. Uh, I think it's a good question. My sense is that uh, uh, we ought not to let our guards down. The important message is that our trouble is not over yet. And you still see a number of cases uh, in the dormitory. And therefore, we actually need to maintain our guards and maintain our uh, vigilance. And therefore, we should maintain the DOSCON level at uh, the orange level. And this will also allow us to raise our awareness and uh, step up our surveillance. And as we move from phase one to phase two, <clears throat> the sense is, is that we are not actually uh, feeling safer and therefore <clears throat> uh, we can celebrate and we can relax and enjoy ourselves. But it's actually a rebalancing because we do want our economy, our community activities to restore somewhat and progressively and hopefully we do so safely. But at the same time, in order for us to do so, actually we need to tighten some of our regulations, our safe distancing measures, and impose more restrictions in other areas so as on balance to continue to maintain a safe environment. So it's not an overall reduction of uh, risk level and uh, vigilance, 
but a more, uh, a, a a more balancing uh, uh, approach by allowing more activities to re resume, but at the same time, tightening our uh, uh, measures. Say, for example, the expansion of our surveillance, our testing, is actually, in a, in a way, stepping up our vigilance in uh, monitoring the situation. So we should not think about uh, changing the DOSCON colour yet. <laughs> I must. I feel compelled to say something. See, Philip, the question you asked has uh, provoked such a uh, reaction from all of us, uh, because it, we really must. We really need to understand the fight is far from over. It, it, there, it's you know there is still a long way more to go. Uh, I, there is, a, of course, it's easy to get into this sense that we have just overcome uh, a major wave of infection and situation is stabilizing, reopening is happening, dorms are being cleared. The sense of relief is quite palpable. And I, you, can, you go out, you see many people who are quite happy to be out and about and to be able to go out to their favorite places. That's very understandable. But all, all the countries around the world that have exited from lockdowns have been grappling with this, which is um, how to maintain that... Uh, allow more freedoms, allow more activities to resume, but still um, recognizing that the virus is not been eradicated, it's still circulating, and that need for vigilance, that need for a new normal to be in place is quite critical. So we, we do need everyone to understand this um, and change our behaviors and mindsets. And on the part of the government, what we are doing as we have been articulating is to step up our regime of testing and tracing. Uh, we, we believe that all the things that we are doing now through surveillance testing, through more aggressive testing, will help us and also the, uh, our ability to do faster activity mapping each time we see a contact. Uh, we, can do, we can get that activity map put out uh, within a day, less than a day sometimes. So all of these are capabilities that have been painstakingly built up over the past few months. They put us in a better position to control the virus, but they are no guarantee of us. Uh, they do not guarantee our ability to contain the virus 100%, right? Because you can, you can be sure with this virus how infectious it is and the ability to spread quickly and without even symptoms, um, something can flare up uh, in, in a group, in, a, in an activity without our realizing it until it's you know, down the road and many, many cases have formed. So that's something that constantly worries us. We are monitoring as best as we can. We are staying as vigilant as we can on the part of the public health officials and the government officials, but we really urge every individual to do their part and stay vigilant and disciplined at the same time. Thank you, panelists. Can we have the next question from Jana from TM? Yes, hi, I'd like to ask this question. Over the past few days, the number of cases on the community has been low. Uh, most of these cases are work pass and work permit holders who are not uh, residing in the dorms. So where do they reside and what is their profile like? And are, is there any imminent possibilities of clusters forming at the places that they stay? Thank you. Uh, many of these uh, uh, workers uh, uh, in the community are actually staying in uh, various uh, quarters arranged by the employers. Uh, so um, these could be in uh, uh, various residences, uh, actually uh, uh, accommodating uh, small numbers of these uh, workers coming together. Uh, we've uh, looked at it and, uh, and uh, to try and discern whether there are various patterns at all, no clear trend. Uh, in some of these cases, but we have noticed that, in fact, in a number of these uh, cases, uh, a number of these cases are being picked up because of our routine uh, uh, surveillance of these uh, workers. Uh, they are working in the community, uh, and uh, because of that, to safeguard the, the safety and welfare of our public, we've uh, been engaged in routine testing for many of these workers. A number, a significant number of these uh, workers uh, being diagnosed, in fact, come off that testing stream. Uh, many of them are asymptomatic, uh, and when we test them, a number of them, in fact, show signs in their testing results that suggest that, that the infection may, in fact, have occurred uh, some time back rather than uh, a recent infection. 
uh, so uh, it may be uh, a reflection of uh, um, uh, uh, what we had described before, uh, cryptic, uh, a low level of cryptic infections that have, that have been occurring among asymptomatic uh, uh, people. Uh, and then we're picking them up because of our routine regular surveillance, our heightened uh, testing regime for these workers uh, that uh, brings them to the fore. Uh, but uh, at this stage, uh, the numbers we looked at continue to be low. Uh, we are vigilant. We are careful to pick up uh, clusters. And where we see uh, the potential for clusters occurring, we will continue to cast a wide net uh, to uh, test all close contacts, to bring them all into isolation and to uh, 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 disrupt any potential chains of transmission that will uh, take place. We've done that consistently, and we'll continue to do it for this group of people uh, to make sure that, uh, that these uh, a few cases do not now erupt into a large cluster as a result of uh, continued uncontrolled uh, uh, transmission occurring among the, the community of workers in these uh, residences. And uh, you probably noticed from our daily report that we now provide some details of each case, uh, whether they are linked, unlinked, whether they are a result of a proactive screening or not. I think you will find that over the last few days, um, the vast majority of the cases are actually asymptomatic cases, and they are a result of our proactive screening. And many of these cases, unless you do proactive screening, uh, you actually will not have picked them up uh, because they don't have symptoms and they will go about doing their uh, work and so on uh, uh, normally. So therefore, these cases are picked up because we are proactively screening them one by one. Some, for example, uh, in the preschool sector, some are the workers going back to uh, work, so we do regular screening for them, and that's how we pick them up. So these are the cases we continue to monitor. To also, once we pick up a case, we determine whether they're active or non-active. If they're active cases, we do uh, quarantines, we do contact tracing uh, uh, like we do for all cases. So if, to make sure that if there are any uh, further infection associated with us, this case, we will be able to ring fence them, quarantine them to prevent further infection. So I think this is what we do, and going forward, we will continue to do that. And as I mentioned, we are testing uh, earlier for those with the symptomatic. Hopefully, we are able to catch the cases faster and earlier, and we can quarantine the contacts earlier to prevent further infection. So I think these are the efforts we take together to keep the uh, infection level in the community as low as possible. Thank you, panelists. We have time for the last three questions. Can we have the next question from Siti from Kyodo? Hi, thank you very much. Okay, so my question is, just now Ms. Minister Lawrence Wong mentioned about uh, business owners who have acted uh, irresponsibly. I'm just wondering whether you can elaborate on that, like in terms of what are the most common offences among businesses in this phase two that got them into trouble and, and what are these uh, offences that you consider most serious in this phase two? Thank you. Well, if they are customer-facing businesses, retail and F&B, then the key requirement is for them to put in place proper safe management practices, uh, particularly in managing the customers that patronize your stores. So if you're in F&B, you have to ensure that the diners are in groups of not more than five people and they are seated at least a meter apart. There is, should not be any live music, TV screening, uh, anything of that sort in the premise. If you are a mall or a retail business, then you should be making sure that your um, the stall itself, the, the, queue, the queue management for your customers is properly done so that uh, if indeed large groups of people come in to you know, patronize the store, you have a proper queue management system and you do not end up with all of them rushing in and then being in close contact with one another. So I think these are measures that we have informed all the businesses. They understand this quite clearly. Um, the, level if, the level at which some of them do it, I think it's uneven. Some, some, are, some are really on top of things and they do it very well. Some can be better. Um, and then, of course, for the ones that don't do it so well, if and when something happens, when a large crowd gathers, that's when the uh, weaknesses in their systems show up. Right? I mean, if you don't have a good system, but there are no, not so many people, then you don't really um, 
test the system. But if you have a weak system of controls and then you have large numbers of people coming to your store, that's when the system is under stress and that's when all the weaknesses show up. And there, there are stores that have, or there are outlets that have run into problems. So, so over the weekend, we've had some issues with some of the F&B outlets in, uh, along, Holland, along a road in Holland Village. And we have taken some action there, actions there. And we are continuing to monitor whether it's F&B outlets or retail shops. And we will, as I said, um, be very vigilant in our um, enforcement actions. And if and when we see breaches happening, we will go in straight away uh, to rectify them. If, if it's a minor breach, uh, we will ask the business to you know, get the, do the necessary rectification actions and then uh, make sure that, the, um, and then continue on with it, right? But if it's an egregious one, then as I had said earlier, we will uh, look at asking the business to close their operations until such time that they can put in place the proper safe management measures in place. Thank you, Minister Wong. Can we have the next question from Yi Jin from Sing Ming? Hi, uh, good evening, Ministers and Dr. Mark. Uh, my question is, uh, as, as uh, general election approaches, we have seen more walkabouts in the community, especially at hawker centres and coffee shops. So uh, we would like to ask, like, uh, will there be any actions taken to the party if the party breached the safe distancing measures during their walkabout? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, question. Uh, the Elections Department has uh, issued their guidance uh, and uh, uh, MEWA and all the other agencies are continuing to watch very closely to make sure that uh, safe distancing measures are not uh, 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 breached. Uh, and this is irrespective of whether um, the uh, parties uh, committing the offences are uh, from political parties or whether there are others uh, involved in this. Uh, we generally take uh, uh, an approach where we would first... Uh, highlight the breaches, uh, give advice and teach and educate uh, people to do the right thing. But if the breaches uh, continue despite uh, counselling and advice is given, or if, uh, the are, uh, if the breaches are egregious, very severe, uh, then we will have no choice but to step in and uh, penalties may have to be imposed. And this is irrespective of uh, who the uh, uh, people are that in fact uh, have uh, carried out these uh, offences or breaches. Uh, therefore, it's not an issue of whether or not these are political parties uh, carrying out their walkabouts or whether they are other individuals. As long as these are breaches that are of concern, they compromise the measures that we put in place to safeguard the welfare and safety of others, uh, and they carry a risk of spreading infection, then we will have to step in and, uh, and impose any uh, disciplinary action accordingly. Thank you, DMS. Can we have the last question from Zhi Peng from Wanbao? Uh, good evening, Ministers and Prof. Ma. Uh, this is Zhi Peng from Wan Bao. My question is, uh, for Singaporeans uh, living in Malaysia, how will they come back to vote on polling day since there are no overseas polling stations in Malaysia? And how many percent of migrant workers staying in dormitories are yet to be tested? Thank you. The second question, I've, I revealed, I shared the figures just now that we have 120,000 workers living in the dormitories who are either recovered, right? That means they've gone through, they've had the infection, they've rec recovered, or they have not been infected before, but we have tested them, put them through the isolation period, tested them again, and they are verified free from, from the virus. That's 120,000 <laughs> as of today. Um, the total population in the dormitories is about 320,000. So that's about 40% today. And by the end of July, we are looking at, eh, there will be a range, this is a projection, right? So um, we, we think we can get up to 80% by the end of July, right? Who are either recovered or tested uh, free from the virus by the end of July. That remains, 20% will then remain um, and hopefully, 
after a few more weeks beyond that, in August, we would be able to clear all of the workers in the dormitories. Uh, that's for the migrant worker uh, situation. For elections, um, the situation is no different whether it's Malaysia or any other country. I, I, I'm not aware of the latest... Yeah, I, I mean, anyone can... I mean, so it's whether it's you're in Malaysia, whether you're in any other country, if you would like to vote and you want to vote, then come back and vote. There, there's no reason why you can't come back and vote. Right? You may have to be um, subject to SHN, but even under SHN, there can be arrangements made for you to vote. Thank you, ministers and panelists, for your time today. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's press conference. We have come to the end of the virtual press conference. The time is 6.38 p.m., and the embargo is now lifted. Press materials such as video footage, photographs, and a sound feed will be emailed to you shortly after the press conference. Please also look out for a press release that MOH will be issuing. Thank you and have a good evening ahead.